We need a real investigation. I don't think we have one yet. Yes, it's true. And yes, it is a crime. Well, thank you, Cleta Mitchell. Thank you for that explanation. Really interesting and kind of appalling. Thank you, really. Tucker. Cleta Mitchell is somebody with great courage, and she's involved with your litigation and lawsuits and all of this stuff. She literally gave up her whole practice not to get paid. She saw how corrupt it was, how disgusting it was, how dirty it was. And I want to thank you on behalf of everybody in this room and everybody in this country. You are a hell of a lawyer and tough. And that's what we need. I'm Cleta Mitchell. Welcome to our podcast, Who's Counting with Cleta Mitchell. Who's Counting is all about elections, election integrity, how elections are supposed to work, how sometimes they don't work the way they're supposed to, and mainly what it is that citizens in America can do to reclaim our election process. We're excited today to have as uh, my guest uh, someone who is toiling in the vineyards uh, of election integrity in an area that People don't talk about very much, but is one that I think is hugely important. And I think after you have listened to our guest today, you're going to agree that this is something that everybody needs to pay attention to. Our guest is Lori Roman. She is the president of the American Constitutional Rights Union. And Lori, I want to welcome you to the podcast and uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Cleta. Nobody understands this issue better than you. So I'm really happy to be with you to talk about it. Well, thank you so much, Lori. Um, before we start talking about the particular issues that uh, are your area of expertise, and as you said, it's near and dear to my heart, uh, let's talk for a moment about Lori Roman. Can you introduce yourself to our audience and tell them about you? Where do you live? Where'd you grow up? Uh, how did a nice woman like you uh, end up doing what you're doing today? Well, I often ask myself how a girl from a factory town ended up in all of this. So I grew up in Flint, Michigan, and uh, and a surprise to many people is that my brother was the role model for Michael Moore. So that just gives you a little a little twist on on the fact that my brother and I <laughs> came from two totally different um, perspectives growing up. And so, a uh, Flint, Michigan factory town. I grew up with. Um, a fourth generation General Motors family. And I started out at General Motors in management many, many years ago. First person in my family to ever go to college. My brothers jokingly called me the white sheep of the family. And um, they said they raised me to be a, a Democrat and union, um, union uh, worker. And I grew up to be a Republican management and they just didn't know where they went wrong. So that's, <laughs> that's how they explained me. And I didn't leave Flint, Michigan until I went into the George W. Bush administration in 2002 as the director of school choice, and then later the deputy director of the White House Faith-Based Initiative Office at the Department of Education. And so um, I can tell you there are many days when I have sh shook my head and thought, how did a nice girl from a little factory end up uh, running around Washington, D.C. trying to affect public policy? But it's my, been my privilege to work on liberty issues. It is my passion uh, to advance the cause of liberty and protect the Constitution in the United States. Um, I am. I eventually became the executive director of ALEC, which is American Legislative Exchange Council, and I loved my time working with conservative state legislators across the country and really valued the work that I did also on the Atlantic Bridge Project, which was bringing together uh, legislators from across the pond uh, on a project that involved members of the European Parliament, British Parliament, Polish Parliament, and our members of Congress and state legislators around the country. And that was a passion project, too, uh, with myself and Dr. Liam Fox, who was a close um, a close person with uh, Margaret Thatcher. And so oh, wow. it was her dream that that close camaraderie and that close partnership that she and Ronnie, Ronnie Reagan, had developed uh, many years before. It was her dream that it would carry on. And so we created the Atlantic Bridge Project to have an exchange program with conservatives from around the world. And um, so it was my privilege to work on liberty with people from all over the world. And now I'm the president of the American Constitutional Rights Union which was started by also Reagan advisors, close advisors to Ronald Reagan. And our founding board member was Attorney General Ed Meese. 
And it is a privilege to have him still on our board. And it was also founded by Robert Carlson, who was considered Ronald Reagan's uh, father of modern welfare reform. He was with him in California and he came to Washington, D.C. with him. And it is just my privilege to uh, to be the president of the American Constitutional Rights Union and have amazing people on our board and people I work with every day, like Ken Blackwell and Morton Blackwell, as we call them, the, the Blackwell Cousins. And uh, others who have joined us um, at times, like Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, who was on our board. So it is just my privilege to continue to advocate for liberty and uh, how this little factory girl got into all this. Uh, I don't quite understand. It wasn't really part of the plan, but sometimes God has other plans. Well, and it is this American story, isn't it? It's it's the great American story. Um, All of us have Many, many of us have uh, similar stories, not the same, but similar. And it all has to do with opportunity. And I guess that's what makes us, that's what makes us so committed to protecting our Constitution. Um, Lori, tell us about what, uh, a little bit about what are some of the projects that the ACRU works on? And that is the website, isn't it? Uh, www. Uh, is it theacru.org? The, theacru.org. Okay. And tell us uh, some of the projects that AC- the ACRU works on uh, before we get into uh, the subject of today's podcast. Well, when it was originally started, it was called the American Civil uh, Rights Union, and it was supposed to be a play on kind of the anti-ACLU. That was the whole point. The ACLU was not truly advocating for people's constitutional rights and liberty as it supposedly did, but it really didn't, and it gone very far left. So when um, Ed Meese and Bob Carlson started it, they wanted kind of an antithesis to the ACLU. We now call it the American Constitutional Rights Union to very quickly let people know that that's what we are about. We are about protecting your rights uh, as outlined in the Constitution. And for um, for many years now, the main focus of ACRU has been working on the First Amendment and defending the Second Amendment. So First Amendment, free speech, Religious liberty, Second Amendment, uh, the right to bear arms uh, shall not be infringed. So we we really abide by that at ACRU. And bir- virtually any issue that would come up that would restrict liberty and be a violation of the Constitution, which means in the last two years, we have really been at the forefront of fighting what we call the crisis tyrants. Those um Those people, those government officials, the bureaucrats who have been using COVID as an excuse to advance authoritarianism in the United States. So early in 2020, in fact, in March, at the very beginning of the shutdowns, we started fighting uh, on behalf of freedom against shutdowns, against threats uh, and shutdowns of churches and helping pastors and and business owners. And then later, uh, moving on to work against the the, uh, COVID mandates, the vaccine mandates, COVID passports. And so if there's something that infringes on liberty, you can bet we're probably involved. We um, we file, as you know, uh, because you've done so much work with ACRU in the past. So um, I'm saying this for other people's benefit because I know I'm not telling you anything. You don't know, Plita. <laughs> but um, so we are uh, very involved in uh, legislative testimony. Uh, we have a C4 and a C3. So we get involved in um, actually changing legislation and on the C4 side. And we also uh, file amicus briefs that go often right to the Supreme Court. We've, just as an example, we've um, filed uh, on behalf of protecting the Bladensburg Cross in Maryland a few years ago. We have something right now in front of the Supreme Court uh, defending uh, the right to um, transport guns in New York State. And so we're often involved in those kinds of things. But the thing that we're going to talk about today that we've been very involved in, and you have been too for over a decade, is election integrity and every variation of it, protecting voter ID and um, just everything you can think of advancing election integrity and protecting against vote suppression and against vote fraud. Well, that that's a great segue and introduction to um, the topic today, because I know that the ACRU has been involved uh, with other organizations, the Public Interest Legal Foundation and that sort of thing. But um, 
What I want to talk about today is uh, the project that you started that um, really, to me, is one of the most important uh, things to talk about, and that is protecting vulnerable voters. And in particular, uh, ACRU, under your leadership, has uh, been at the forefront of, and I don't really know another conservative organization, or for that matter, I don't really know of a liberal organization that is actually committed to protecting elderly votes. So tell our audience, what does that mean? What is Protect Elderly Votes? And um, what does that involve? And how did you get started doing that? Two things I think came together. One is uh, we've known as conservatives for many years, we've um, had anecdotal evidence that there was fraud going on in nursing homes, that there was either vote for suppression, sometimes staff members filling out votes for people or not allowing people to vote. And for years and years, it's been something that's been talked about. And to my, to my, uh, to, to the best ability that I have, I couldn't find examples of anyone really tackling it in a systemic manner. I mean, it might pop up once in a while, but no one was really going after it in a, in a big way. But the other thing that kind of met that in the middle is that I have always had a real passion for protecting people in nursing homes. And so when I was very young, even in my late 20s, I, um, I was on leave for a while with my first child. And I decided that while I was on leave, I would uh, volunteer in a nursing home. And I led a Bible study and then that advanced into many things. So I, um, I did the work on the ground for years. I, I volunteered in a nursing home. I fed people. I read people their letters. Um, I helped them with activities. I led a Bible study. I'm a horrible singer, but I even led them in singing hymns, which <laughs> it's a good thing they couldn't hear very well because I'm really bad at that. And so um, it's just always been a soft spot for me. I love old people. I love cranky old people. I love nice old people. I just love old people. I think we have so much to learn for them from them. And I think they're, they're just a treasure. Um, so many of these people were... You know, World War II, they really were the greatest generation that I was dealing with. And, and my own parents uh, had me late in life. And so they were also of that generation. And I truly have a soft spot for them. Uh, for a time, I was the president of a trade association representing the salt industry. For over a decade, I did that. And one of the things I found when I was president of that trade association is that um, some of the dietary restrictions at nursing homes were hurting people, in fact, really hurting elderly people. So I started to advocate for them in that way, too. So this seemed like a logical um, next step for me after many, many years of really caring about people in um, residential facilities. So I took that election integrity um, desire to, you know, protect um, the vote along with my desire to just protect elderly folks in residential facilities generally. And I put that together in a project that I started in 2019, almost the second that I, I started at ACRU. And it started out as Protect Elderly Votes, and people can still um, go to pr protectelderlyvotes.org to see information. Um, and it's morphing into protectvulnerablevoters.org, which will also send you to the same website, which we're in the process of expanding to all vulnerable voters, as well as uh, homeless and those in nursing homes, assisted living, and group homes. So, let, you, so, Lori, so Lori, let's talk about, um, because you and I have talked about this before, My one of my very first volunteer activities in the election process was when I was in law school at the University of Oklahoma, and I was on, I was appointed to the Cleveland County, Oklahoma, that's where the University of Oklahoma is located, uh, absentee ballot board. And what that really was, was that uh, under state law um, in every county, there was a, there were dates when um, you had a Republican and a Democrat who took a, an old fashioned wooden ballot box and ballots to nursing homes. And you had one Democrat, one Republican, and you had very strict instructions about what you could do to assist, what you couldn't do to assist, uh, but to enable the and so I went around to all the nursing homes with uh, my counterpart and, um, and that I've never forgotten that because I've always thought, well, that's the way to do it, to make sure that, um, that elderly people who are confined to a nursing home have the opportunity to vote, 
but that they have the opportunity to vote in a manner where they're not under any kind of undue pressure, they're not under undue influence, and it's really their vote that's being cast. But um, so I come to this from that experience from many, many decades ago. And so I know that uh, in 2020, that you really ramped up the Protect Elderly Votes project. What are the specific things that you did and, and, and what, uh, I, I, pr I presume that those things uh, can be located at the website, but talk, walk us through specifically, what did you do in 2020 and where did you do it? So in 2020, we chose seven states where we thought fraud was uh, likely. Uh, I think it's probably likely in more states, but we chose seven that we felt that we could handle. And then we did also a sampling of another 1,000 nursing homes across the country. So every single nursing home in assisted living in seven states received our attention, and I'll explain that attention in detail. And then 1,000 other, basically a sampling across the U.S. of nursing homes and assisted living so that we could cover the whole U.S. really. So the states that we chose in 2020 were Florida, Texas, Arizona, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. Um, so that meant in every, sing every single residential facility that was a nursing home or assisted living received a legal letter from us written by our legal team that outlined federal laws their state specific laws on subjects such as absentee ballots or ballot harvesting or anything that would affect how things might happen at the nursing home. Uh, like, like in Oklahoma, some states do have very strict laws about having uh, nonpartisan, two representatives or, or bipartisan go in to assist and oversee the votes to make sure no, no shenanigans are happening. And so, um, so we would outline any of those pertinent laws to educate the director. The, now, those were very serious legal letters. They came from a, a legal office of an, of an attorney that we work with, and it was a serious letter. And I, I joke sometimes that like the ACLU, we often send scary letters. Uh -huh. And those letters tell people, you know, here are your responsibilities. Here's what you should do. Here are the bad things that can happen if you don't do them. And um, so it's kind of carried in a stick. Yeah. The, people need to know. And I've seen the letters and they're very impressive. They're very thorough. They outline what the, st what the law says, what the law requires insofar as elderly voting in a, in a nursing home. So I, I, my hat's off to your legal team. I thought that I thought they were very good letters. Thank you. So those letters had the carrot and the stick. So the stick was, here are the laws and here are the things that can happen. I mean, it could be a felony. Uh, you could get undue publicity to your nursing home. Um, we could assist families and residents with um, with formal complaints and sworn affidavits that would go to the either the appropriate, the secretary of state or the AG or a district attorney in your area. And um, because we have a vote fraud hotline, and if we get a complaint from a family member or someone from your facility, here are all the options at our disposal of how we can help uh, remedy this situation. Uh, one of the first being that we'll probably contact you. And then that's the stick. You could get sued, you could get prosecuted, you could have bad publicity. These are all the bad things that could happen. And the, But the carrot is, we're here to help too. We have a Senior Citizen Voting Bill of Rights. Here it is. We enclose it in the letter. Um, we are happy to let you, if you want more information, talk to someone from our legal team or talk to one of our staff who are educated in this area. And we just want you to take voting seriously. We want to make sure everyone gets to vote who is entitled to vote and that no one faces coercion or undue pressure to vote a certain way. And that no one's uh, ballots are are discarded or handed over to activists who may not have the best of intentions. And I think one of the most important things this letter did is warn these directors of what we call stranger danger. Mm -hmm. To not give ballots to strangers, to not give ballots to activist groups who are willing to ballot harvest or as we call now ballot traffic who will offer to come pick up the ballots and get them to the election supervisor's office for you. Don't fall for that. 
In most places, you can call the county supervisor or election officials. They'll come get the ballots. You don't have to put them in the hands of untrustworthy people with no chain of custody. And so, um, so the carrot the stick. Why would you, but, but let me just stop you right there. Why would you, what is the stranger danger? What, what would you fear if, from some partisan picking up uh, a handful of ballots? I can tell you, we, our vote fraud hotline did get information and we also got uh, an anonymous kind of sort of anonymous tip from an actual election official in the state of Florida who informed us that the League of Women Voters was ballot harvesting at senior citizen facilities all over the state. Hmm. And, and is that, that, they, is that illegal in Florida? Well, they found a little loophole in Florida law. People would always say, well, ballot harvesting is illegal in Florida. Well, what they found in 2020 is, well, it's illegal if it's a paid ballot harvester. Uh -huh. But volunteers had a little wiggle, wiggle room. And so the League of Women Voters, some of those people may have had the best intentions. Uh, but some of them may have not. But the point is that was completely unnecessary in Florida to put ballots in the hands of uh, organizations that um, had showed no chain of custody, had no uh, real promise that every single ballot might get to the election office. When in Florida, it's very, very easy. The election supervisor folks will send someone right to the nursing home. They do it all the time and they will pick up the ballots and they will oversee the process. You, you just invite them in. So it was really unnecessary. We also got a call to our vote fraud hotline that there was a, a very conservative um, Republican leading uh, facility in Lee County where we got a call that activists were meeting staff members in the, in the uh, parking lot at the ends of their shifts talking to them about something, but we couldn't be sure. But the person who gave us the, um, the tips said they really felt like they were possibly being coerced or pressured into getting involved with the voting. And so what we were able to do is have one of our attorneys call the director of that facility and just give him a heads up. This is, this is, the, um, this is the tip we received. We thought you might want to be aware that your staff may be, there may be attempts at compromising your staff or having them discard ballots or do something um, that is illegal. And we have materials to help you train your staff on how to protect legal voting. And we have materials for your residents and their family members on how to protect their votes. And so we were able to Per, I think prevent fraud. And that's really the goal of this whole program is that over a period of years, we work with so many nursing homes and enough nursing home associations and private companies that have chains of nursing homes that we get them to understand the importance of this, that this isn't just one day a year and you shove it off to your activity director and you don't give it another thought, which is something we have found. Um, Often they shove it off to a very low level staff who are not at all briefed or educated on what the laws are. And they just, you know, they just don't think about it that much. Well, we want to elevate this. We want there to be best practices. We would like there be to be systemic and widespread training on the responsibilities of the facility, the laws, and we would like the facilities themselves to educate the families and the residents on how to protect their own votes by using our materials um, and our Bill of Rights. And just um, once we have that happen over a period of years, if we can make this systemic, we can create best practices within the industry. Um, and I think we will prevent a lot of fraud. And if you think about it, for instance, in a state like Florida, the governor's race was decided by 30 some thousand votes. We have more than 30 some thousand people in Florida who are nursing homes and assisted livings. Now you add in the group homes. Mm -hmm. If you could prevent fraud at the group homes, assisted livings, and nursing homes throughout the country, you can make sure every senior votes that should vote and can vote and um, that no fraud is occurring. It really can make a difference in having free, fair, and accurate elections. I mean, you saw in Texas last year, 
a social worker was brought up and one was indicted of 139 counts of attempted vote fraud for trying to vote for her group home um, uh, folks that she had, was in charge of. 139 counts. That's just one person. Imagine. Um, but our hotline just really exposed how deep the problem is, how widespread the problem is, and how much work we have to do. So have you done a report uh, about the calls that you received to your hotline, or can you tell us, can you share with us some of the things that people reported to you on your hotline? Some of it was just absolutely shocking, and it informed us on how we should approach this in the future. So in 2022, we are, we are ramping this up. We had a call to our vote fraud hotline of a, a family member, a, a daughter of a woman who told her daughter that she was told they would withhold her food and medicine if she didn't vote the quote right way. Mm. Um, and that was just disgusting, just disgusting. Um, Sadly, what, one thing we found out is that some people, when it comes right down to taking legal action and getting involved in um, doing sworn affidavits to the attorney general or the district attorney, um, they are afraid for retribution for their um, family members, especially during COVID, when they couldn't get in to check on their family members. They were afraid of angering the workers and they're afraid of the retribution. And that's what happened in that particular situation. We couldn't get the family to pursue it anymore because they were afraid and they didn't really have any can, other place. I can understand. I can sure understand that. Um, and that was one of the things that concerned me greatly about uh, 2020 uh, was COVID when you um, didn't have nursing homes were not allowing family members to come in and visit and those are often the that's how there's that's the accountability um hopefully if there's a family member who can come in and check on what's going on and all that was removed during covid has that has that uh, alle been alleviated are uh nursing homes allowing family members to visit their their loved ones again some are still very strict and and some have loosened up um it was a real problem last year in implementing this project as far as being able to investigate. Um, I think it will be easier in 2022. Um, we had another call that came from Lubbock, Texas. It was a daughter who was, had durable uh, power of attorney over her mother's um, affairs. And after the election, this one was after the election, she looked on the Texas website and found that her mother had voted. Her mother was a nonverbal uh, dementia patient who had no idea who the current president was. Um, and the family said, well, we don't even know how she got a ballot. We didn't, we didn't change her address. And we know that she's not capable of voting. We know that she can't remember what she had for lunch today. So we didn't change her address with and we didn't change her voting registration. So we don't even know how she got a ballot. Uh, in that situation, we were able to take sworn affidavits from the family members, the, the, um, the, the two daughters. Uh, our legal team assisted them in filing a formal complaint with the Texas AG's office. And then they did open an investigation. Now, here's where I think we learned a lot last year. Um, I don't feel like the Texas AG's office did a very thorough job investigating, but I do believe that in the future, we will be less trusting of turning it over whole cloth to the authorities, and we will do tandem, I think, investigations when the situations warrant and when we can. It was a little difficult last year, though, because of COVID. So we couldn't really get in there and um, meet with the director of the nursing home. Um, it, it was difficult last year. I think it will be easier in the future, but we're, we are ramping up our investigations. Um, I think the investigations will also have a preventative effect. So even in some situations, if we don't get prosecution, I think that nursing home will be less likely to let bad things happen in the future. So my, um, my thesis is this. 
no one's risking going to jail for one vote. If they're if they're filling in one person's vote, they're probably filling in a whole bunch of votes. Right. And so every time we find one or we get one complaint, I assume that's representative of many more. And um, the more these nursing homes get calls, they get investigations, there are affidavits, there will be an effect throughout the industry, which is what we want. And every time we do an op-ed on this or do interviews or do radio and um, it will have an effect over time. Also, we really are trying, well, we formed a working group and some of the people in the working group are members of this industry and we want their input. It's a little tricky because every state laws are, every state has different laws on this. So, but we want their input. We want best practices. We want to involve the nursing home associations at both the state level and the national level. And they should be training on this. And so I, I was going to ask you what the reaction has been from the industry to, uh, to your uh, approach and your offers to help them with this. I mean, I, was, I, I suppose it varies by person and by uh, the leadership, but I was just curious as to what their reaction has been. Well, it has, it has been varied. We have had, um, we've had some directors of nursing homes who have just been very appreciative. They want the follow-up phone call. They want a little mini training session. Some of them have availed themselves of talking to our legal folks and they want to do a good job. Um, some of them are just happy to have something to hand out. So we give them handouts to educate um, both their staff and their residents. And then some of them are just, I would say, just kind of apathetic about it. This is, I can't even tell you how many times our phone bank, because we follow up, every one of those letters was followed up. Our phone bank called every single nursing home in seven states. Everyone, every. Every nursing home and every assisted living is hugely labor intensive. And we said, we followed up. Did you get our letter? Do you have any questions? Would you like more training materials? Um, just to let them know we haven't forgotten about them. We're, we are serious about this. And so many directors would say, I pass this off to my activities director. Right. And um, the other thing I think we find, which is, always a hardship for us because we're buying lists, we're buying updated lists and we're putting them into our database and we're creating, that's how we started. We started this proprietary database that we update every time we call and we find out there's a change, we're actually changing the name in our system. And what do we find out? The turnover rate in this industry is just gigantic. Huh? And it's very- I'm it's, the managers, the administrators. Yeah. The either the director or the person who they have in charge of the voting stuff, which is often a, a second, you know, like a middle management type person or an activity director, um, those turn over quickly. So as we're trying to keep up this database that we've created, it's a lot of work. So um, so we're adapting as we go. And for next year, we'll be adding a couple of states. Uh, we're also going to add some congressional districts where we think there might be shenanigans as we keep our ear to the ground and try to figure out where where things look like there might be shenanigans. And, and we're expanding our toolkit um, and we're expanding our outreach to, uh, like we did, we recently did in Virginia, influence the influencers. Educate people about this who are maybe not necessarily in the industry. Mm -hmm. But other people in the community who are influencers to help them understand that this is a problem, we do need to fix it, and it really helps to have a lot of eyes and ears on the ground and uh, and solicit people to help us get the word out, get the materials and I, and, out. And, and I want to talk about that in just a moment. Um, but one of the uh, examples, I think, that really brought it home to me that I know that you uh, followed up on, and that is the situation in Racine, Wisconsin. Um, can you describe that, uh, what happened in Racine and how it relates to what you're doing? Well, Racine, Wisconsin had a complaint from one 
daughter named Judy, whose mother was at a nursing home. And she found out that her um, mother, who had severe dementia, voted in the election. And so she started looking into it. And what she found was she really felt that this, uh, that the nursing home had not followed state law. So the state law is pretty specific in Wisconsin about who can help with ballots, who can not help with ballots. It's also pretty specific that you have to have, there's a law that requires voting deputies from each party to be present during the voting process at nursing homes. That's a law passed by the legislators. And so thanks to Judy's complaint, because she suspected someone took advantage of her mother, the district attorney turned turned the uh, complaint over to the sheriff's department for investigation. Now, this is a model of what should happen across the country when it comes to vote fraud, and I'm thrilled that they did it this way. And I think we can all learn from it, whether it's vote fraud on this or vote fraud on anything else. Complaints should be investigated. That's right. They should be investigated by people who will have experience investigating. Right. And they should not necessarily be investigated by people who have, let's say, a vested interest in the outcome. So it was wonderful that the DA turned this over to the sheriff because that DA could have sat on this. We know they could have. And this was the right thing to do. The sheriff found that the Wisconsin Election Commission, because citing COVID, Mm -hmm. suspended the law that required the voting deputies from each party to be in the nursing homes during the voting process. And they did not have the authority to, to suspend a law. No. They are, I mean, bureau- they are bureaucrats. Yeah. And we've, we saw that all over the country with all kinds of election oh, laws. Oh, okay. but all kinds that, of bureaucrats that, waving right. magic wands, thinking they could suspend and change laws. Um, and I will say Republicans and Democrats did this. Uh, we saw some problems with this even in Georgia. Yeah. And we um and we saw it, we saw it all over the place. They all thought the bureaucrats all thought they had magic wands and they could change laws and they could suspend laws, they could put laws on hold. And so the sheriff found that the Wisconsin Election Commission had not only um suspended the law, but they had sent out guidance to every single nursing home, every county in the entire state, uh suspending the law. And leaving it really wide open for nursing home staff to, here was the phrase, execute the vote. Execute, the staff could execute the vote. That meant a lot of staff were helping, helping people fill out their ballots who had no right to be helping people fill out their ballots. And that's how Judy's mom, a severe dementia patient, ended up um, getting voting. And then they started investigating this one nursing home. And I, they think that was eight families, mm-hmm. eight families who said our family member was not able to ask for an absentee ballot, That's right. was not able to f- have the cognitive ability to fill out a ballot by themselves. Therefore, someone did this for them. And that kind of leads also into the whole problem last year was that absentee ballots were not going out because people requested them. They were just going out. And if you got a batch of absentee ballots at nursing any nursing home around the country that was pushing out absentee ballots that were not requested, just pushing them out, then that made it awfully easy for staff to help people vote. Or, 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 uh, vote, or vote in their stead. Or vote for them or coerce them. But they there were stacks. And this is another thing that came in our vote fraud hotline all over the country. There were stacks of absentee ballots floating around nursing homes with no chain of custody, no supervision, uh, not under lock and key, batches of them, batches of them, completely insecure. This this happened everywhere, everywhere. Um, This is just a problem nationwide in nursing homes and all over the place. We also had our voting fraud hotline. A woman in California said she got 12 ballots for 12 different names to her home. People who had lived in her home for the last 25 years got ballots. She said, I could have filled them all out. So it wasn't just a problem in nursing homes. Um, So in Wisconsin, 
the sheriff did a great job. They did a press conference. Then they referred it. Um, they're still pursuing criminal charges. They believe there will be criminal ch charges. But also, the main thing is they believe that the Wisconsin Election Commission should be held accountable for subverting the law. And that's where it gets passed to the legislature. Mm. The Wisconsin legislature now steps in. And I think this is another learning opportunity for the rest of the country. Because legislators, you have a responsibility constitutionally. That's where it should be. State legislators, you have a constitutional responsibility to protect the integrity of the vote in your state. And thank goodness Wisconsin is doing that. And they formed a, um, a special counsel, an office of the special counsel. And they appointed former state Supreme Court Justice Michael Gableman to lead an investigation of voting integrity in the state because likely not just fraud in that one nursing home or suspected, I should say suspected fraud in that one nursing home, probably problems all across the street, state because the Wisconsin Election Commission actually was encouraging illegal behavior. They were well, encouraging and condoning illegal behavior. And that's the thing that is so frustrating uh, to those of us who watched everything unfold in 2020. But the good news, I think, coming out of 2020, if you can find any good news, is that I think it has awakened uh, uh, the American people and many millions of people who are getting involved in various uh, and sundry activities related to election integrity. And uh, one of the things that I'm hoping is that people will form local task forces, local election integrity task forces. And one of the components should be protecting vulnerable voters. Um, and I will urge people, uh, maybe we can post a link on the website, uh, on our website, uh, the who'scounting.us website. We'll post a link to the Racine Sheriff's uh, press conference. There, there's a PowerPoint that's available on their website, and we'll post that along with the materials from Protect uh, Elderly Votes that, that you've put together, um, because I think it's instructive. And I, I it it would be ideal if there would be a citizens group in every county who would go around and personally meet with the um, nursing home administrators and say, we're here to help. And here's what they'll basically take your materials, but hand deliver it. That would be, that would be my goal. But uh, that would be wonderful. It would be great. And I'm hoping that we can uh, encourage people to do just that because that's not something that readily comes to people's minds. But I'm trying to bring it to their minds. And thank you for all the materials that you have produced, because I think that uh, people are, are amazed to, to find that there's this resource for them. But, um, but you mentioned um, that you have expanded. It's not just elderly people in nursing homes who are vulnerable. Um, and I always say that partisans, uh, particularly on the left, uh, they prey upon these uh, vulnerable voters and these vulnerable citizens. They don't pray with them. They don't pray for them. They pray upon them. And uh, we've seen that uh, in the 2000 election where there were people handing out um, cigarettes to the homeless people um, uh, in Wisconsin and um, in exchange for their votes. And I've certainly had reports of that in communities uh, across the state voting areas where there be, might be a people from a group home who are being, who brought in uh, on a on a bus, and then whoever is their quote activities director, basically goes in with them and um, and does more than the law allows in terms of uh, assisting the practice, but basically votes them. And so, what what are some of the things that you're doing to um, expand from just the elderly votes to uh, other vulnerable voters? Well, Cleta, you've been a champion of this. Um, I think you were the first one that that coined the term vulnerable voters um, for us in our thoughts of expansion. So uh, we have um, we have started uh, creating a, a database of group homes now. The Texas situation of the indictment with the 139 counts of that social worker mm -hmm. really spurred us on to see that there is a real opportunity for fraud in, in the group homes. Um, so we're expanding into the group homes. 
We also, when, if we get sufficient funding, we will also expand this education program into 55 plus communities. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we are also, uh, AMAC, the, um, the, what is it? The American Mature, I'm going to get it wrong, but AMAC. Association of Mature American Citizens. That's it. They (laughs) have been great. They're wonderful. They're fabulous. They have been uh, amazing in allowing us that now we can uh, write regularly in their newsletters and to start informing their membership, which I think is million strong now, inform their membership. Their membership, generally, their their age group, I think that they most um, represent is actually the age group of the people who have parents in these residential facilities. So if you have people in their 50s or their early 60s, they're dealing with these issues with their parents. And so um, so it's helpful to get that information to them. It's also helpful because eventually, you know, down the road, those same folks. Um, one of the other things that we did last year that we hope to get enough funding to do this year or in 2022 is we did radio ads. We did uh, stranger danger radio ads, mm-hmm. um, alerting folks in Florida to not let strangers touch their ballots. And it was a cute radio ad. It was an elderly gentleman who said, we taught our children stranger danger. We said, stranger danger, you know, stay away from strangers. And and now we have to think about, we shouldn't let strangers touch our ballots because there are people who would like to take our ballots and make sure they don't get to, um, they don't get to the ballot box. So that was, that was fun. Um, we also did radio ads and we'd like to expand those. We did radio ads just informing people of the issue and letting people know that vote fraud is a crime and in some cases could land you in jail. And in in those ads, which were both in Spanish and English, we were trying to let, now think about Florida, lots of people here work in this industry. Many, many, many people in Florida. And we were trying to reach the workers um, so that they knew that they have to take these laws seriously. So there's just so much more we can do. And then, Clayton, you gave us a great idea that we needed to expand our toolkit. And so one of the things we're going to to do is create this interactive map so that people can click on their state and they'll be able to um, find the right information for their state, copy of our letter, um, other information about uh, the election officials or election laws, and uh, even you know, possibly a link, it looks like, that we'll have to your county election official. And because that's the first spot, if you're having a problem, you want to tell your county election officials that there's a problem at, at your nursing home in your area. That's that's a good place to start. But call our vote fraud hotline, too, uh, so we can be on top of it and make sure the bureaucrats are also doing their job. Well, I think that there is so much to do, and you're right. I mean, the we do need to protect um, our parents, our grandparents, and our fellow citizens who um, have contributed mightily to our country and our society and our communities. And we just need to make sure that um, we don't have social workers or uh, staff people. Uh, Many of these nursing homes are staffed by people who are members of uh, a union, the Service Employees International Union. Um, They've really targeted a lot of these kinds of facilities to try to grow the numbers, uh, the mem- uh, their membership of their unions. So, um, you know, they're, they're, and they're very politically active, the SEIU. So, Lori, um, you know, I, I just think that you're doing God's work and um, <clears throat> the respect that um, you're showing to our elderly population and our vulnerable populations. I've, I've thought about uh, that we probably need to come up with some additional protections. I noticed, I know that in Georgia, one of the things that uh, the Georgia legislature was persuaded to do was to let homeless people register wherever they wanted to, uh, even if they didn't live there, obviously, because they were homeless. And I just think that, and so we saw these multiple registrations at these activist organization headquarters. And you can't tell me that they're not being, um, that those people are not being um, put under undue pressure uh, when it comes time to vote. So I think that maybe we need to have some protections for homeless and others to be able to register um, at a central location or a place where they can their votes can be supervised by 
um, officials and not by uh, the strangers that you're talking about, because I think there is danger in that. But um, is there, are there other things that you would like to encourage people to do? Um, you've, you've been so generous with your time. Is there, so, is there anything else that you would like to encourage people to do to help uh, spread this message and to take action? Well, I'd like to put some responsibility back on our state legislators who constitutionally bear, you know, they bear this responsibility for, for our secure elections. So I would uh, hope that our state legislators would look into this. Um, there have been some folks who have taken this very seriously, uh, like Seth Grove in Pennsylvania. Yes. But, but there are many things that could be done even at the legislative level uh, you could have the agencies at the states put out guidance that nursing homes must train their staff who are going to be overseeing the voting practices of of their facility. They must be trained. I don't think that's too much to ask. If they are going to, if, uh, if and that they must obey the laws. And so I think there is some room there for some state laws. I would like state legislators to also look at uh, increasing the criminal penalties for vote fraud. We've seen over the years that it has kind of watered down. It used to be more felony jail time. Um, we did a little bit of research recently and we see that it's often a misdemeanor now and a little slap on the wrist. It should not be a slap on the wrist, especially. I mean, all vote fraud is horrible, but vote fraud against the elderly and the vulnerable is disgusting and it's abuse. It it's is. abuse of their most sacred rights. And so I really do believe there, ha there has to be an increase in the criminal penalties on that. So there are things state legislators can do. Um, county election officials, they need to be on the ball on this too. Uh, I live in a county where the county election official is amazing with nursing homes. Um, she just spends so much time on outreach to the nursing homes and the assisted living. She's phenomenal. I wish we could just clone her. They have a responsibility and folks in your county, I would say, go to your county commissioners, go to your um, open houses that your election officials put on and they should be putting them on and ask them, what are you doing to make sure that no one's suppressing the vote of the elderly in the nursing homes or, or committing fraud against them or coercing them to vote in a certain way, um, put the pressure on them and then, um, Family members, family members, so many people. Just because mom and dad are in the nursing home and you didn't change their voting registration, don't think that someone else didn't do it for them. Right. And so protect your family. And then the other thing is in almost every state, you can look and see if people voted. You can't see how they voted, but you can see if they voted. If mom and dad have dementia and they shouldn't be voting or you know that they couldn't possibly ask for an absentee ballot and do it, then call it to someone's attention. Um, oh, that's another thing for state legislators. They need to tighten up the language on, um, on, on the absentee ballots. If you made absentee ballots only available to people who personally requested them, not mass absentee ballots, you they could solve a lot of these problems in the nursing homes very quickly. Um, the nursing home should not be getting ballots for people who have no cognitive ability to ask for one or fill one out. Right, right. Well, you know, I think that there is so much to do. And uh, Lori Roman, we're so grateful for all that you're doing. We thank you so much for um, joining uh, Who's Counting today. And uh, again, if you want to get more information and resources, then you can go to the link uh, on our website, www.whoscounting.us, but you can go directly to protectelderlyvotes.org. Did I get that right, Laurie? Protectelderlyvotes.org. And yes. uh, there is more information, more resources. Uh, we all have to be about the business of protecting these elderly votes and elderly voters and uh, as well as other vulnerable uh, communities. So that's something that all of us need to be concerned about. Lori, thank you so much for all you're doing. And thanks to our audience for joining us for this episode of Who's Counting. Hope you'll join us for our next episode. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Cleta. 
Thank you for listening to Who's Counting. The Who's Counting podcast is produced by the Conservative Partnership Institute's Election Integrity Network. It is filmed and recorded at CPI Studios in Washington, D.C. Help us grow this show by sharing this episode with a friend and be sure to subscribe and to give us a good review. We need your word of mouth because big tech can't be trusted and tries to cancel us daily. Help fight back by visiting whoscounting.us and sign up for this podcast, for our newsletter, become part of the Election Integrity Network.